When its waters are calm, Lake Michigan, like all other large bodies of water, can be a sight to behold. Its majesty draws countless people to its shore, to watch, to listen, to take dips in its cool water. However, as anyone who has navigated its waters can tell you, the lake has another side, a menacing, violent side, capable of tremendous destruction. In very little time at all, its surface can change from a quiet, passive roll of whitecaps to gray, boiling waters. The floor of Lake Michigan is littered with more mysteries than history will ever solve. Huge, hulking ships, such as the one we are looking at now, have met disaster when confronting this Great Lakes fury. Storied ships, proud vessels of yesteryear, have taken on nature's forces only to become a part of Great Lakes maritime lore. The SS Milwaukee was one such ship. Even today, over 60 years after her demise, it seems impossible that such a big, powerful ship could lose its battle against Lake Michigan's wind and waves. But lose she did. And during the course of this program, we will look at the mystery of the Milwaukee's last voyage and a sinking that has never been fully understood. And through the eyes of a team of expert divers, we will see her as she is today, calm and silent, at rest in the lake that claimed her. From the earliest days of settling and commerce in the upper Great Lakes region, Lake Michigan has been an important cog in the success of just about every kind of industry imaginable. The coal, iron ore, and lumber industries in Michigan's upper peninsula profited enormously by sales made in Milwaukee and Chicago. The product transported by ship down the length of Lake Michigan. Other ships brought cargo across the width of the lake moving between ports in Michigan and Wisconsin. Huge, steam-driven ships competed with railroads for the shipping business. And tough, well-muscled seamen became almost legendary for their ability to take on rough jobs and the elements. Perhaps toughest of all were the men who worked on the car ferries, the giant ships that transported railroad freight cars across the lake. These crews faced weather conditions almost unheard of by those working in other areas of shipping. Except for the car ferries, Great Lakes was a seasonal business dictated by the weather along Lake Michigan. Smaller ships, such as the schooners running lumber from Michigan to Chicago, could not begin to withstand the rigorous winter waters of the lake. So most shipping ceased in November, when water was still reasonably calm only to be resumed the following spring. This was not the case, however, with the car ferries. Known for their size and strength, car ferries worked 12 months a year, day in and day out, braving gale force winds and ice fields on the lake, delivering their shipments under conditions that might have done in smaller vessels. Of course, this is not to imply that the industry was reckless. Indeed, the Steamboat Inspection Service, run by the United States Department of Commerce, set very strict safety standards under which car ferries were inspected and given approval to operate. Ships had to be properly repaired and maintained, or they would not be allowed to sail. It was that simple. There were no exceptions to the rules. In addition, the captains of these ships had to pass demanding examinations 
in order to be awarded their rank and master's papers. Not just anyone could command a car ferry, which is just as well, since the rigors of this type of operation demanded that a captain strike the proper balance between upholding safety standards for ship and crew and delivering a shipment on schedule. Given the nature of the rough waters of wintry Lake Michigan, this balance could be difficult to maintain. Captain Robert McKay, known in the business as Heavy Weather McKay, knew as much about the car ferry business as anyone operating on the lake. Known for his gruff manner, the Scottish captain had weathered many a rough trip across Lake Michigan on car ferries and other types of ships. Early in his career, while he was first mate on the Naomi, later named the SS Wisconsin, McKay had proven his skill when the Naomi caught fire in the middle of the lake. Staying calm in dire circumstances, McKay had guided the ship's passengers to lifeboats, and he had helped with rescue operations. His heroism was not soon forgotten. Unfortunately, McKay would be immortalized by the voyage he was unable to complete. As captain of the car ferry Milwaukee, he would meet his fate in the frigid Lake Michigan waters on the evening of October 22nd, 1929. To this day, no one knows exactly what caused Milwaukee to go down. Though all theories lead back to heavy weather McKay's decision to sail in one of the worst storms Lake Michigan had ever produced. By using hindsight, one can say that the final voyage of the Milwaukee was probably a classic case of man versus nature. Old sea hand versus the water he had devoted a career to taming. Hindsight also makes it easy to question Captain Robert McKay's decision to sail on the afternoon of October 22nd, 1929. As records would later show, Lake Michigan had never seen winds blowing at such velocity for such an extended period of time. Such second guessing, however, does not begin to tell the story. Captain McKay not only knew every inch of the Milwaukee, a huge 338 foot vessel with a gross tonnage of 2933, but he was also familiar with a storm that had churned the lake into a maelstrom of high waves and powerful winds. At noon on the day of his fateful journey, McKay had brought his vessel into Milwaukee after crossing the lake from Grand Haven, Michigan. The journey had been fierce, but the ship had made it through. McKay had no reason to believe that he would have any more trouble making the return voyage. Some of his crew thought otherwise. In fact, even as the ship's cargo was being secured for what would undoubtedly be very rough passage, three crew members were taking in a movie at a local theater. They were that convinced that the Milwaukee would not sail in the storm, that it would instead remain at the dock until the seas had died down. These three were not alone in this line of thinking. Other crew members made the same assumption and were not at their posts when McKay ordered the engine room crew to stand by at three o'clock that late October afternoon. These assumptions were anything but frivolous. Neither of the car ferries in the slips on either side of the Milwaukee were willing to take on the stormy lake. Both had been on the lake earlier that day, and their captains had seen enough. Robert McKay may have earned his reputation by pitting his considerable skills against the elements, but members of his crew could probably be excused for their belief that even he would not attempt to cross the lake in the face of the howling winds and mountainous waves that only seemed to gain momentum as they worked their way across Lake Michigan. Captain McKay took all the measures and precautions to assure that his cargo was safely secured for the voyage. The Milwaukee was equipped with an impressive battery of heavy chains, jacks, blocks, and clamps 
to keep the railroad cars immobile on the four sets of tracks on board. McKay was confident that the cargo would hold fast, even if his ship had to pitch and roll its way across the lake. All told, the Milwaukee was carrying 25 boxcars loaded with cargo of their own. Seven cars were loaded with feed, while three carried salt, and another three carried barley. There was one car of automobiles and two others loaded with bathtubs. Two carried lumber. Rounding out the Milwaukee's cargo were two cars of canned peas and individual cars carrying corn, butter, grits, cheese, and veneer. All officially registered, secured, and locked into place when Captain McKay issued his order for half speed ahead and the Milwaukee eased its way from the dock. There was a crew of 47 men on board. No one would see them alive again. Although there is no way to know for certain, it is likely that Captain McKay realized that he had more on his hands than he had bargained for before he had sailed very far onto the lake. Eyewitnesses reported the Milwaukee to be struggling almost from the onset of her journey. Three miles due east of the harbor, the captain of the U.S. Lightship 95 caught a 10-minute view of the Milwaukee as she pushed her way eastward pitching and rolling heavily in the rain and monstrous waves. It was the last time anyone saw the ship. That evening, the lake had one of its roughest nights in history. As it was, the fall of 1929 had produced a series of killer storms, claiming their fair share of ships and badly damaging countless others. But none of these storms compared to the one on Lake Michigan on the evening of October 22nd. Those who had been out on the lake and survived told stories of the incredible battering their vessels received from waves. Never would pay a huge price for the damage to their respective vessels that night. In Grand Haven, no one gave much thought to the Milwaukee's not arriving on schedule. Seasoned veterans of Lake Michigan storms had ways of dealing with bad weather. They would stall for time, moving their ships directly into or away from the wind. Doing so offered the elements less target. On one earlier voyage, McKay himself had stalled for 38 hours, riding out the storm until the wind abated and he was able to make his way to port. This time, however, it was not to be. When another Grand Trunk car ferry, the Grand Rapids, arrived in Grand Haven, shipping officials began to worry. The Grand Rapids had left the Milwaukee Harbor four hours after Captain McKay's ship, and its captain reported seeing nothing of the Milwaukee or its crew. Even so, there was no reason to panic, and officials were relieved when another ship's captain reported that he had spotted a vessel that looked like the Milwaukee taking shelter behind Beaver Island. The Milwaukee shipping officials reasoned would eventually turn up. Sadly, this optimism was very short-lived. On the morning of October 24th, a steamer found bits of wreckage, mattresses, and furniture floating in the water not far from Racine, a city to Milwaukee's immediate south. In the wreckage was a large quantity of white painted wood which, the steamer's captain figured, was probably a portion of a cabin or deck house and it could have been from the Milwaukee, which was painted that color. However, none of the wreckage could be immediately and positively connected to the Milwaukee. A huge search party was formed on both sides of the lake. Planes scanned the lake for signs of Captain McKay's vessel, and Coast Guard ships carried out a desperate search of their own. Nothing was found. To the dismay of shipping officials, the ship spotted near Beaver Island was not the Milwaukee, but was instead a package freighter run aground in the storm. On the morning of October 25th, the sad truth was determined 
when the bodies of two crew members of the Milwaukee were found near Kenosha. Both were wearing SS Milwaukee life preservers, and one was wearing a watch that had quit running at 9.45. Other bodies were found by two other ships at two other locations later that same day. On the 26th, a Coast Guard crew from St. Joseph, Michigan, found a lifeboat with four crew members who had apparently escaped the sinking ship, but had died of exposure on the lake. Near Holland, Michigan, an empty lifeboat was discovered. The storm had been so serious that it had scattered the wreckage and the poor unfortunates of the Milwaukee to all parts of the lake. With such scattering of the wreckage and victims of the Milwaukee, rescue operators held little hope of finding survivors. Indeed, all 47 members of the car ferry's crew perished in the storm, and most of their remains were never recovered. In the aftermath of such a tragedy, one main question loomed in front of investigators. What exactly had happened out on the lake? With no survivors, there could only be speculation. Slowly, working with evidence left by the wreckage, and from what they already knew about the physical makeup of car ferries, investigators pieced together a story of the Milwaukee's last trip on the lake. What emerged from the investigation was a story of a mighty struggle that Captain McKay lost, not all that far from the safety of the Milwaukee Harbor. Two pieces of evidence were especially helpful in the reconstruction of the Milwaukee's final hours. First, the recovered watch indicated that the ship had sunk or had been abandoned by 9.45 on the evening of October 22nd. This helped corroborate a second and very stunning piece of evidence, a note found bobbing in the water in a bottle, written by A.R. Saden, the Milwaukee's purser. The note, authenticated by Saden's acquaintances, offered a brief sketch of the ship's desperate plight near the end. It read, SS Milwaukee, October 22nd, 29, 8.30 p.m. The ship is making water fast. We have turned around and headed back for Milwaukee. Pumps are working, but Seagate is bent in and can't keep water out. Flicker is flooded. Seas are tremendous. Things look bad. Crew roll is about the same as on the last payday. The note was signed, A.R. Saden, purser. Another bottled note was found washed ashore near Muskegon, Michigan. This one, simply signed McKay, offered a three-sentence message. This is the worst storm I have ever seen, the note read. Can't stay up much longer, hole in the side of the boat. However, no one familiar with the captain's handwriting, including Captain McKay's widow, was able to positively authenticate the handwriting signature as being McKay's. The note may have been real, or it may have been the kind of cruel hoax that would occasionally appear after a maritime disaster. In any event, investigators had two solid pieces of evidence to help them understand the disaster. In all likelihood, McKay had concluded that the Milwaukee was not capable of making the trip across the lake through the storm. This conclusion may have been precipitated by high waves pounding over the ship's seagate and flooding the car deck. Owen D. Gallagher, captain of the Grand Haven, another car ferry, had his own opinion of what happened. According to Captain Gallagher, it was possible that the Milwaukee's Seagate was washed away entirely when McKay tried to turn his ship around against the violent sea. If this had happened, it would have been impossible to keep the sea from flooding the ship from below the decks. Satan's note contained another important bit of information. By saying that the Milwaukee's flicker was flooded, he had indicated that the car ferry had, by 8.30 in the evening, taken on a substantial amount of water. The flicker is seaman's slang for the living and sleeping quarters, which on the Milwaukee were located beneath the car deck and not far from the engine and boiler rooms. If the boilers or engines had failed due to flooding, the Milwaukee would have been at the mercy of the storm and would have sunk in short order. Even if the engines and boilers had worked to the bitter end, the flooding of the flicker probably meant that the Milwaukee was in the process of taking on so much water that it was doomed, even as it made its frantic attempt to return to the Milwaukee Harbor.
There was another plausible theory. What if the restraints on the railroad cars had given way during the storm? It was certainly not out of the question, given the violence on the lake that evening. If this had happened, the cars would have been sent crashing into the hull of the ship, rolling violently with the waves, with such tremendous force being pounded against the ship with its pitching and rolling on the tempestuous waters, it is entirely possible that a hole was torn into the ship's side, something mentioned in this short message supposedly written by Captain McKay. That McKay had turned the Milwaukee around and was heading back to port was proven when the sunken ship was finally discovered, a battered wreck resting on the floor of Lake Michigan. Ironically, she had almost made it home. On calm seas, her arrival in the Milwaukee port would have taken less than a half hour. In his final battle against the elements, heavy weather McKay had lost by a very narrow margin. The SS Milwaukee lies at a depth of 125 feet in an upright position. The divers explore the wreck. Like an underwater vault housing relics that have remained a mystery for more than six decades. A box used for coal. a ventilation tube. Looking into her hold, we see several bathtubs. The bumper connect for the rail cars. The ship's name in faded paint that barely reads Milwaukee. One of the stanchion posts used to raise and lower the stern gate. Over the Milwaukee's stern, a lot of cattle fencing lays about the stricken deck. Looking onto the stern gate, you can see how it's twisted like a pretzel. The port side propeller. The ship's starboard propeller, partially buried in the lake's floor.
The vessel's rudder, with a freshwater burbot fish, nicknamed the lawyer fish, perched on top of it. The diver tries for a catch of the day. Better luck next time. Rails leading into the wreck. A pot lies on a debris field. Second level of the bow area. The windlass used to raise and lower the ship's anchors. An abundance of lawyer fish, one of them tangled in some ropes. Some bullards, a freshwater tank, Back out to her bow, a rail car block. Donkey engine. The Milwaukee's capstan near the peak of her bow. The pilot house is washed off 100 feet to the ship's side. Heading back down port side, We explore the twisted decking dropping down into the boiler room. The divers spot another ventilation tube for the engine room. Looking from the port side, we come across a refrigeration rail car with its very thick housing. Notice the open hatches used to drop in the ice. Looking down through a deck opening, we can see some of our cargo of toilet tanks and sinks. Looking into one of the rail cars, the diver locates an old truck. See the steering wheel and note the remains of the seat springs. The opening of the coal chute, which leads into her coal bunker by the stokers.
The diver makes his way into the engine room. It is very tight squeeze indeed. But he wiggles his way in. The Milwaukee's starboard engine. Port side steam pipes. Lots of debris now covers her catwalks. The side of the port engine. Oilers. Look down the port side drive shaft. Notice the three oilers. The painted star on the port engine. Main electrical panel, gauges, and switches. An oil can handle. A maze of catwalks. The diver moves along the steam collectors and steam pipes. The steam gauge reads 250 pounds of pressure. Heading back toward the ship's stern, Tools. A chain hoist. Lower level starboard side. The stern storage area. A light fixture with three different light bulbs, still intact, both AC and DC power. We are now directly over a workbench with a grinder and hand crank. An engineer's chair. A generator. The hole that leads out of the ship. The diver enters the flicker.
the main corridor leading back to the starboard side. Fire station hose number 13 on the lower deck. Notice the hand painted smiley face on the starboard shaft. A chair in two and a half feet of silt. An old telephone booth. A chalkboard with the words left number two written on it. A fan lies below the porthole. Now roaming through the portside crew quarters. upper and lower bunks. once painted white, now has two feet of silt. A very meager place to sleep indeed. More bunks and closets. A chair. A sink in the flicker. An alarm bell. Starboard room bunks. A long community sink.
steps leading to the second level of the bow. The bumper connect for the rail cars. Head of the starboard side with silt filled to the top of the toilet bowl. A common sink. An antique ragtop automobile. The cloth top is rotted away, but the windows are still intact. After an extended deep water dive, it is now necessary for the divers to decompress before they can safely return to the surface. In the aftermath of such a maritime tragedy, shipping and inspection officials looked to find ways to prevent such a disaster from occurring in the future. By the safety standards of the time, the Milwaukee was in good shape, seaworthy, and capable of taking on all but the greatest storms on the lake. She had been inspected twice in the four months prior to her final voyage and, with the exception of needing one minor repair, she had been judged to be in good condition. Records from previous years indicated that she had been properly maintained and repaired at the cost of over $33,000 to her owners. So there was no question that the Milwaukee owners had seen that the ship met the rigid safety standards imposed by the Steamboat Inspection Service. Indeed, no one doubted that the elements had been responsible for the Milwaukee's demise. All one had to do was inspect the damage to the other ships that had managed to escape the lake's fury that day. Ships newer than the Milwaukee had taken a terrible pounding and had required extensive, expensive repair. Still, puzzling questions remained. Why, for example, was there no wireless radio aboard the Milwaukee? Granted, radios were not required by safety standards, and radio communication would not have saved the Milwaukee from her fate. But one could not help but speculate as to whether lives might have been saved if there had been shipped ashore communication aboard the Milwaukee. Some of the crew had been found in lifeboats, while others had been found in a lake wearing life preservers. In all likelihood, they had died of exposure rather than from drowning. Could they have been saved if a rescue party had been sent out before the Milwaukee sank? Some of the inspectors seemed to think so. As it was, between 30 and 36 hours passed between the Milwaukee's sinking and the discovery of the first signs of the wreck. In addition, when the SS Wisconsin sank in Lake Michigan during a similar storm a week after the Milwaukee tragedy, Rescue teams had been able to save many crew members' lives. The Wisconsin had been radio-equipped and had sent distress signals as soon as her captain realized that the ship was in grave danger. Then there was the issue of the ship's Seagate. By design, the Seagate was supposed to break the momentum of rough seas crashing aboard the ship's stern during violent weather. In the case of the Milwaukee, where the Seagate had either been badly bent or swept away, Allowing water to move forward on the ship and enter its below decks through hatches, one had to wonder if the sea gates were either too small or mislocated. In his report, one inspector suggested that the tragedy might have been averted if the sea gate had been located farther inboard, where water would have been stopped before it had reached the car deck. All this, of course, was speculation. But the sinking of the Milwaukee did lead to the discussion about these two safety standards. And, in short time, ships were required to carry radio communication systems aboard, and sea decks were redesigned to be more efficient in violent storms. In this way, the Milwaukee had left a legacy that would benefit the future. The storms on Lake Michigan in the fall of 1929 would stay legendary in Great Lakes maritime history. The lake would have its stormy seasons in the decades to come but few that could compare to the mayhem caused by the lake during the season that saw the stock market crash and the country head into an economic depression. Captain Robert McKay had taken on his greatest foe in one last battle, but even in defeat, 
He became a part of an illustrious history that even today continues to intrigue and inspire those who stand on Lake Michigan's shores and gaze outward. The forces of nature endure.